Thank you, welcome to join to our Sunday evening service. Let's all stand as a uh, blessing we have tonight. Kathy, you lead us, please. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Gary or Dale is going to lead too much of what doing it tonight. Sundays left of this month. Uh, we're going to sing two more Christmas songs tonight. We only do this once a year, then we leave the songs alone, Christmas songs. So if you grab your sing to the Lord, and we'll begin by turning to page 173. 173.
tonight, I want to speak to us on the candle of joy. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. We spoke in Matthew chapter 2 this morning, and in Matthew 1, we made it verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall, for bring, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And my text this evening is verse 21. She shall give birth to a son, and you are to give to him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for another wonderful privilege to to call on your name. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus, you did come as a babe on this earth, that we could be saved from our sins, Lord. We don't know where we'd be if you never showed up on this earth. We just trust you. Give us a fresh awareness of what you did by coming to the, the earth in the flesh. And all that you do for us, Lord, we'll praise thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. No other word so completely captures the Christmas spirit as the word joy. It describes so many of the feelings of Christmas. Joy is when children see their, their presence, when relatives arrive at the homestead, when Christmas pageants feature the angelic qualities of children, when grandmother announces that dinner is served, and when the choir sings the annual Christmas cantata. Undergirding all these activities is the quiet confidence that God has indeed invaded our lives. Not only did he enter the human race at that first Christmas, but he also entered our own piece of history. The birth of Jesus provided the rebirth of our soul. Yet, for some at Christmas, joy is absent. It is but a hollow day instead of a holiday. The good tidings of great joy is not real for them. Missing from their lives is the pleasant assurance that life has meaning. They are lost in the artificial whirlwind of Christmas. The decorating, baking, gift buying, and other activities of Christmas are but one more hassle in their already gloomy lives. <clears throat> but it is at this point that the symbolism of the Advent wreath has the most to say. We light the candle of joy because we believe people can indeed be freed from the dullness of this life. The birth of Jesus provides the joy of abundant living. First of all, I want to look at the joy of the name Jesus. Joseph was a troubled man. Can you imagine? The news Mary had given him had brought many responses, but none of them could be described as joy that day for Joseph. He was deeply disturbed. You see, he loved Mary and was betrothed to marry her. Betrothal was more binding than a simple engagement. It required divorce action to terminate it. But Joseph was not a callous man. The scriptures describe him as a righteous man who did not wish to make a public scandal of Mary. He had come to the decision that he could no longer be associated with Mary. His agony must have been overwhelming. While Joseph was still considering what he should do, can you imagine how he felt? God sent an angel 
to explain Mary's condition. Joseph must have been received the announcements that day with much joy. What a relief it had to be to know that Mary was still the honorable and godly person he had always known her to be instead of being a, a prostitute or whatever. In addition, the angel told Joseph to name the child Jesus. For us here in our culture, names are usually little more than a means of identification. But for the Jews, names were descriptions of character or designated some human event. The name Jesus is from the same root as the name Joshua. It means Jehovah is salvation. The angelic announcement of a name added to Joseph's joy. This child shall save his people from their sins, Matthew 1, 21. Every time anyone called his name, they would be reminded that Jehovah is salvation. Just as Joshua led Israel to conquer the land, so Jesus would lead God's people to conquer sin. And just as there were still pockets of resistance when Joshua died, so at the death of Jesus, all sinfulness was not eradicated. But Jesus did save us from our sins and from the penalty of our sins. This was the fulfillment of prophecy 400 years before. The psalmist had said, He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Psalm 130, verse 8. In Matthew 121, there is reference both to the person and work of Jesus. His personhood is found in his name, for he is the Savior of the world. His work is found in the descriptive phrase that he will save his people. Life only has meaning, folks, in our salvation. That is, our failures, mistakes, and sins will not be held against us forever. Aren't you glad? I got saved 49 and a half years ago. I had a lot of sins in my life. But when God saved me, when the Lord saved me, they were covered by the blood, never to be brought up against me ever again. They're under his blood forever. Amen. I'm so glad that Jesus came, that we can have purpose and meaning in life by giving our life to him. You see, life only has meaning in our salvation. I know before I got saved at age 16, I didn't have any meaning and purpose for life. I was just floundering, just going from one day to the next. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. The gloom of having to carry your failures forever is removed in Jesus. Second, the joy of the name Emmanuel. Matthew continues the birth narrative by adding an editorial comment that all of this happened to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 14. In Isaiah 1, and 23, he refers to a second name for Jesus. The name is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Through the incarnation, God has become a man. This is perhaps the greatest of all miracles. There is much debate concerning the virgin birth of Jesus. Skeptics, for one reason or another, doubt the validity, uh, validity of the scriptural narrative. Suffice it to say that those of us who accept the miraculous nature of the Bible also accept this miracle. But the greatest miracle at Christmas was not the virgin birth. As great as that miracle may be, it pales in importance to the spiritual fact that God had taken on the human form of a baby. God is suddenly no longer out there somewhere in space or hidden in another dimension. He is here now, living among us. But how? How can this be? The mystery of Christ's birth is mind-boggling. It's hard to put your mind around it. Parting the waters of the Red Sea, or raining down fire on Moses. Mount Carmel seems so insignificant to this miracle. To believe that the God of creation, the ruler of the universe, the all-powerful, all-knowing God of heaven, has taken on the form of a baby, it's really staggering. Yet this is exactly what we are called upon to believe. The Gospel writer indicates that at last God is here in a way he has never been before. God is with us. Some believe that Isaiah only intended to convey the idea that God is on our side. This is open to debate, but Matthew's interpretation of the Isaiah passage is very crystal clear. 
God is just not on our side. He is with us, and he's living among us. The Gospel of John says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. God no longer needs a tabernacle or temple or sim to symbolize his presence among us. The good news of the gospel is that Emmanuel is here. Thus, this name also adds to our joy that I'm preaching on tonight. God is among us as he never was before the incarnation. Walking in his presence without a priest or some holy man to intercede for us is now our individual joy. Mankind continually seeks happiness. The pursuit of happiness is embedded in the preamble of our Constitution. Many achieve a human satisfaction that provides a temporary lift for their spirits, but joy that is permanent and eternal is found in the Christmas event. God has come to live among us and to save us from our sins. This is the spirit of Christmas. This joy is easily found by faith. Thus, faith is the key to a joyful Christmas. <clears throat> the spirit of Christmas, it's the spirit of giving. We read that, that the wise men brought gifts and presented them to the newborn king of Israel. They brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is the king of metals and is so appropriate, an appropriate gift for one born to be the king of men. This new king was to rule, not by force, but by love. His throne was to be a cross. They brought a gift of frankincense, which is a gift appropriate for a priest. The Christ was to be the high priest who would open up the way to God for sinners. He was to build the bridge by which we could come into the presence of God and by which God in love would enter our lives individually. The wise men also brought a gift of myrrh, a place that was used to anoint the bodies of the dead. Even at the beginning of Christ's life, there was an indication of a cross at the end of the way. Jesus Christ was to be the true king, the perfect priest, the supreme savior. The wise men are not the ones who started the practice of giving gifts at Christmas. It is appropriate for us to take note of their gifts for the king. But let us not forget the great gifts the king gives to us. First of all, let's look at the gifts through the king. The Christ of Christmas was born to be the king of our hearts. For the kingdom of God, he was born and lived a sinless life on earth. For the kingdom of God, he prayed and preached and wrought miracles and taught his disciples. For the kingdom, he suffered the darkness of Gethsemane and endured the awful agony of the cross. For the kingdom, he arose from the dead and lives to make intercession for those who come to God through him. Jesus Christ is the one whom God has appointed to be our king. He offers us the gift of forgiveness. You see, our part is to repent and turn from a life of evil and self-destructiveness. He offers us the gift of eternal life. He gives us eternal life out of the generosity of the Father God, Romans 6, 23. He offers us adoption into the family of God, John 1, 12. He offers us guidance through the difficulties and perplexities of life. John 8, 12. He assures us of fruitfulness and significance if we will abide in him, John 15, 5 and 6. He wills that we be with him forever. I don't know about you, but I'm glad. I'm looking forward to that day. When I die, I'm going to be with Jesus forever. He has given us the Holy Spirit to be our guide. If we ever need guidance, folks, it's today. The Holy Spirit will be our teacher and helper throughout all the journey of, of our earthly life. These precious gifts of God that come to us through His Son are perfect, they're precious, they're permanent, and they're personal. Second, I want to look at the gifts for the King. 
The wise men brought rich gifts and presented them to the Christ child while he was still a baby. They could not possibly know the joys of his salvation yet, as we know them today. If they brought the best that they had, it follows that we should bring even greater gifts to this one whom God has appointed to be our king. Let us give Jesus Christ the throne of our hearts. Satan wants to be enthroned in our hearts and be the sovereign of our lives. That's why we have spiritual warfare. The devil is constantly trying to defeat us and give our um, commitment all of a sudden to Satan instead of keeping it to Jesus. Perhaps Satan's greatest rival for this position is our own selfish selves. We have an ungodly desire to put ourselves above all persons and things at times. Instead of giving self the throne right of our lives, which means giving them really to Satan, let us give them to Jesus every day. You see, Jesus deserves to be king because of who he is. Jesus deserves to be king because of what he has done for us. And third, he deserves to be king in our lives because of what he will do in us and through us in these last days. Present your body as a gift to God in gratitude for his great mercies to you. And he's been merciful to all of us, folks. He really has. Paul taught the believers at Corinth that their bodies were the temple of the Holy Spirit. He further declared that their bodies belonged to God because they had been purchased by God in the act of redemption. In reality, Paul was encouraging them to let God so abide within their bodies that others would be reminded of his gracious presence in them. Bring the gift of thanksgiving and give God the praises of your heart. Through the psalmist, God declares, He who brings thanksgiving as a sacrifice honors me. Psalm 50, verse 23. You see, to remain silent when we can give praises to God for his goodness is to rob God and at the same time deprive others of the blessings this testimony should bring to them. To give a joyful testimony about God's goodness before non-believers is to encourage them to trust God with their lives. That's why we become the light of the world when we do this. This is the greatest favor that we can give to an individual and it's the greatest joy that we can bring to the Father. The spirit of Christmas, it's the spirit of giving. God initiated the spirit by giving his son to be our savior. To become our savior, Jesus became our substitute. He bore our sin by dying on the cross and God raised him from the dead to show his great love for us. Because God loved, first, loved us first, we should love him. Because God gave his best, we should give our best back to him. Why does God love a cheerful giver? It's because God is a generous giver himself. God loves in a special way those who have responded to his love and become the channel through which his love reaches others. The spirit of Christmas is the spirit of giving. Let us become givers of ourselves to God, to our family, and to others. Some may say, is Christmas too costly? One of the standard complaints heard at Christmas time is that the holiday is just way too costly. Is Christmas too costly? The answer to this question depends on every individual's viewpoint. What about the very first Christmas? Was it costly? Oh, yeah, it was. It cost Mary and Joseph the comforts of home during a journey to Bethlehem and an angel directed exile to Egypt to protect the Christ child from the wrath of Herod. It cost mothers and fathers in and around Bethlehem the massacre of their babies by the wicked Herod. It cost the shepherds the neglect of the shepherd's life for a journey to Bethlehem to see the thing the Lord had made known to them. The Bible says, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger, Luke 2, 16. It cost the wise men a long journey. We talked about that this morning, how they walked probably 500 miles or on a donkey or whatever. Expensive gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It cost the wise men. It also cost them changed lives. 
and a journey home by another way. They couldn't even go back home the same way they came. It cost the early apostles and the church persecution and sometimes martyrdom. It has cost missionaries untold suffering and privation to spread the gospel of Christ. What did Christmas cost God the Father? That's a good question. It cost him more than all. For it cost the Father his only begotten Son. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What did Christmas cost Jesus? It cost him a life of sacrifice and service, a cruel death that is unmatched in all of history. Is Christmas costly? Yes. Is Christmas too costly? That's another question. And I want to discuss it right now with you. First of all, Christmas is too costly if it does not mean hope. The prophecies of the Old Testament had pointed to the coming of the Messiah, the great deliverer. The world had been looking and longing for his coming for more than 4,000 years. The waiting time had been long, and the world was weary. It was to a world almost without hope that the angels had brought their message of hope. People since that day have not been without hope. Those who know the Christ of Christmas will never be without hope. Hopeless are all those who have not heard about Jesus. Second, Christmas is too costly if we don't receive God's gift, if we do not experience God's love. The greatest word of all for Christmas is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. No one understands the first Christmas until he experiences the love of God in Christ. And let our hearts, folks, be filled with love, the genuine love of God in Christ, and let us manifest that love to others. Third, Christmas is too costly if we don't experience the forgiveness of sins. An angel said to Joseph, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, Matthew 1, 21. To the shepherds, an angel said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Paul spoke of the costly purpose of Jesus' coming, in whom we have redemption through his blood, for forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1, 7. Malcolm 4, tells the story of a man who sat down after Christmas to review the damage. He wrote to a friend, and I quote, the toys we bought are already broken. The tree has lost its freshness and has been thrown out. We have overeaten, overspent, and overlooked. We would truly overlook the true meaning of Christmas if we forgive that forgot that Jesus' purpose for coming into the world was to seek and to save those that were lost. The fourth reason Christmas is too costly if we do not radiate joy, and that's the title of my message, Candle of Joy Tonight. The angel of the Lord said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Luke 2.10 Joy filled the hearts of the people who heard the good news from the hillside. Joy filled the hearts of Simeon and Anna in the temple where they realized the significance of the child for the world. Joy filled the hearts of the wise men when they saw his star, when they presented their gifts and as they returned to their homes after worshiping the Christ. Joy is a Christmas word. Let joy fill your heart during this Christmas season. Five, Christmas is too costly if we do not manifest peace and goodwill among people. The angel of the Lord said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men, Luke 2.14. There is no room in the Christian life for bitterness at Christmas. 
You see, Christmas is the time for peace and goodwill. If we have been recipients of God's goodwill, then we will have goodwill toward God and to others. Christmas means giving up unreasonable and stubborn attitudes. Christmas is the time to re-examine our attitudes in the light of the Christmas star. To have the true spirit of Christmas, we must have peace with all people. Six, Christmas is too costly if we do not proclaim the good news. What is the good news of Christmas? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The greatest privilege, folks, that can come to any of us is to share our knowledge of the Lord with those who do not know him. And there's many in our communities and eerie areas that know nothing about Jesus. This can be done through our witnessing efforts, our soul winning efforts, and our missionary programs. We can link our lives to God's eternal purposes by proclaiming the good news. Make this Christmas meaningful by sharing the good news. And number seven, my last point, Christmas is too costly if we don't exercise faith. Faith is the word for Christmas. God's faith in man is revealed by the gift of the son, Jesus. Can anyone ever doubt that God cares for sinful people? God has provided the object of humankind's faith. God's wonderful provision demands a response. Remove your doubts and questions by responding with faith in the Lord Jesus. Christmas isn't too costly if we respond to our Lord. God loves us tremendously and he wants to come and dwell with us. He can do this through the Christ of Christmas. I don't know about you, but I'm glad Jesus is our candle of joy, our king and our hope. For 2022. Amen. Shall we stand? Gary Wright, will you close the prayer, please? Father, we thank you again for this message tonight. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus came and went to the cross. He paid the price for our sins. We thank you, Lord, for loving us, for your mercy. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you'll bless each one that's come out tonight. Courage, strengthen us. Watch over us now, Lord, as we go to our individual homes. And for all that you do, Lord, we'll give you the praise because you're worthy. It's in Jesus' name.